the omniscience of God. O M N I S I E N C E. Now, welcome. This is the omniscience of God. The word omni, we have defined it as all. When we say omniscience, we are saying the state of having total knowledge. Omniscience is that nature of God that tells us that God knows all things. It's the quality of knowing everything. For God to be sovereign over his creations, he must know them, he must know all things, whether visible or invisible. He has to be all-knowing for him to be God. And beautifully, God knows all things. And we are here to prove it in scripture that God knows all things. 1 John chapter 3, verse 20. We we'll begin from the new, we we'll go to the old, we we'll return to the new. 1 John 3, 20. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Underline it in your Bible. And knows all things. There are those who say, if God knew that Adam and Eve will eat, why did he allow? Listen, God knows all things. But man can choose how he will end. God knows that if man sins, man will die. God does not need to know whether Adam will touch it at 6 o'clock or at 7 o'clock. God knows that if Adam touch even since midnight, he will die. That's what we mean. He knows not only the minutest details of our lives, but everything around us. Again, Matthew chapter 10, verse 29 to 30. That even if a sparrow falls, God knows about it. If he watches over every sparrow, how much more does he love us? Matthew 10, 29 to 30. And not, this is Jesus speaking. And not two sparrows sold for a copper coin. And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear therefore. For you have more values value than many sparrows. So God knows. That means you know what? You're walking on the street and a bird falls down and is dead. God knows about that. That that bird is dead there. And you have more value than birds. That means for those who steal birds and, and, and go and roast them, you steal chicken. And God knows. <laughs> you may hide the feathers. God knows. Not only does God know everything, all right, about his creature, he actually also knows everything that will occur until the end of history. Look at Isaiah 46, verse 9 to 10 quickly. Isaiah 46. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none other. I am God, there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel will stand, and I will do all my prayer. The omniscience of God. God even knows our thoughts before we speak. Psalm 139, verse 4. God knows our thoughts before we speak. Psalm 139, verse 4. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. Again, he knows, he knows our hearts from afar. Why? He saw us in the womb. Psalm 139, verse 1 to 3. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thoughts from afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down. And are acquainted with all my ways. Look at verse 15 and 16. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret. Meaning, while you were being formed, all right? Spermatozoa, in the uterus, in the womb and all that, God knew you. When I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest part of the earth, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. That's why abortion is terrible because God sees that as a baby and sometimes he even calls them nations. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed and in your book they all were written. The days fashioned for me when as yet there was none of them. Again, Solomon expresses this truth perfectly when he says, 
for you. You only know the hearts of all the children of mankind. That's First Kings chapter 8 and verse 39. Look at Acts of the Apostles. You will see that the Apostles also believe this. Acts chapter 1, verse 24. When they were praying in the Acts of the Apostles, see what they said. Lord, and they prayed and said, You, O Lord, who know the heart of all, show which of these two you have chosen. I mean, you know, this is uh, Matthias and all that. He says, Lord, you know all things. The Lord who knows all things. Now, omniscience means to have all knowledge. Omni, all. Knowledge, science, or science, all right? Only a being that is infinite and eternal is capable of knowing everything. A finite being cannot know everything. The knowledge of a finite creature is always limited by a finite being. God being infinite is more than a university professor who focuses on a branch of his course. For example, in the medical field, or let's say even among psychologists, we have what we call medical psychology, clinical psychology. You'll be surprised there'll be child psychology. So, so it's, and even within that, then there is a subset, it's like universal set, and then there is a subset, and there is a sub of that subset. And so there are like, stems and branches and subdivisions so God being infinite is more than a university professor who focuses on a branch within a broader department all right, and course of study God never learns anything or gains new knowledge he understands all things perfectly the future and the past and the present are completely known by him nothing catches God by surprise God knows our thoughts and actions. 1 Samuel chapter 6 verse 7. First Samuel chapter 6 and verse 7. 1 Samuel 6 7. Now therefore, make a new cart. Take two milk cows which have never been yoked and hitch the cows to the cart and take their cows home away from them and this was the ark of god all right returning to ancient israel first kings chapter 8 and verse 39 first kings 8 39 then here in heaven your dwelling place and forgive and act and give to everyone according to all his ways whose heart you know for you alone know the hearts of all the sons of men. Psalm 44, verse 21. Would not God search this out? For he knows the secrets of the heart. He knows the secrets of the heart. There is what is called God's foreknowledge. Isaiah 42, verse 9. The foreknowledge of God. Isaiah 42, and verse 9. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Meaning God is saying things before they even happen at all. It means that he knows all things possible, as possible as they can be known. All things certain are certain. All things contingent as contingent, all things future as future, all things past as past, all things foreordained as predestined certainties. For Samuel chapter 23. Let's see verse 10 to 13. Then David said, O Lord God of Israel, your servant has certainly had that soul seeks to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Keilah deliver me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O oh Lord God of Israel, I pray. Tell your servant, and the Lord said, He will come down. This is for knowledge. God knows what He will do. God knew what Saul will do. 
Jeremiah chapter 38. Jeremiah 38. Jeremiah 38, 17 to 20. Then Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, Thus says the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, If you surely surrender to the king of Babylon's princes, then your soul shall live. This city shall not be born with fire, and you and your house shall live. But if you do not surrender to the king of Babylon's princes, then this city shall be given into the land, sorry, into the hand of the Chaldeans. They shall burn it with fire, and you shall not escape from their hand. And Zedekiah the king said to Jeremiah, I'm afraid of the Jews, lest they deliver me. But Jeremiah said, They shall not deliver you. Please obey the voice of the Lord which I speak to you. So it shall be well with you, and your soul shall live. God, through Jeremiah, told the king what will happen. Although the king, all right, Zedekiah was afraid of Jeremiah's counsel. Biblical foreknowledge does not entail philosophical determinism, meaning, Oh, God already knows that I will lie. No. You chose to lie. Uh, God knows those of us that will go to hell. Mm -mm. You chose to go to hell. God remains free to make decisions and alter his purposes in time and history according to his own wisdom and will. God is not a prisoner of his own foreknowledge. Let's see that. God is not a prisoner. Of his own foreknowledge. Numbers 14. Numbers 14. 11 to 20. This is Moses interceding for God's people. I will strike them with pestilence. Disinherit them. Make of you a greater nation. Moses said, no, sir. And he began to intercede. If you kill them, the nations who have heard of your fame will now speak, saying, because the Lord was not able to bring these people out of the land, which is what to give them. Therefore, he killed them in the wilderness. And then he began to, all right, um, intercede. And so, and God decided, okay, let's have it this way. God said in verse 20, I have pardoned according to your word, but truly as I live, all the earth should be filled with the glory of the Lord. Second Kings 20. Second Kings 20, verse 1 to 7. This is the story, I'll just summarize it. The story of Ezekiah's life that was extended. When the prophet told him, set your house in order for, that was Isaiah told him, you will die. And he turned his face toward heaven, toward the wall, and prayed to the Lord. And the Bible says in verse 5, God said to him, return. And tell Ezekiah, the leader of my people, thus says the Lord, the God of your father David, I've heard your prayer, I've seen your tears, surely I will heal you. On the third day you shall go up to the house of the Lord, and I will add to your days 15 years. <laughs> God sent the same prophet to deliver two different messages. But it's God, no, even prophets cannot question. He knew about people's lives before he ever met them. That, and that, well, now I'm talking about Jesus, alright? The word made flesh. That's why Jesus could say, oh, Zacchaeus, oh, the Samaritan woman, John 4, 18. Ah, you've had many husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband, it's your roommate. You are living couple's life. He tells the disciples Lazarus was dead, and he was over 25 miles away from Lazarus' home. John 11, 11 to 15. He told the disciples to go make preparations for the Last Supper. And he described the persons they will meet and all right, the steps to take. Even the coat that was tied. He said, you will see a coat tied. Tied. Tell them. He said, this one, no one has sat upon it. Tell them. Was Jesus monitoring the coat while he was preaching about? No. John 11, 11 to 15. Mark 14, 13 to 15. Nathaniel, Jesus knew his heart before he met him. John 1, 47 to 48. He said, Nathaniel, good man. That's all expressions of omniscience. And somebody may say, well, if God is all-knowing and all-wise, why should he be asking questions? And I've explained this in my teachings. When God, that God is omniscient does not mean he cannot ask questions. When God asks questions, he's not looking for an answer. For God 
to be looking for an answer is to not be omniscient. No. When God asks questions, he's looking for a response of faith. When God asks questions, he's looking for repentance. When God asks questions, he wants to bring man to an understanding. It's not God. God is not confused. And when we see the Lord face to face, our knowledge of him will never still be fully complete. Our wonder, our worship, our praise will continue for all millennia. Why? Because God is infinite. Even when we transcend and become, all right, when uh, corruption is swallowed by incorruption and we are now spirits, we still are not, because we are finite, even though we are spirits and have been given eternal life, we don't know all of God. We keep knowing, we keep fellowshipping, we keep worshipping, we keep worshipping Him, the one who is omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, omniscient, incomprehensible, the self-existent God. This is it on the incommunicable attributes of God.